This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan <coughs> does like knowing animals. <coughs> hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. This episode is from our Protecting Animals series where we talk to animal advocates past and present about the work they do for animals. My name's Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. ASA is a really, really good organisation. I love ASA. They work really hard to support animal studies scholars They bring information about funding opportunities, conferences, publishing opportunities, and they also organise a conference every two years. It's very, very affordable to be a member of ASA, so think about joining ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. This episode is also brought to you by the wonderful people at Animal Publics. What's Animal Publics, I hear you say? Well, Animal Publics is part of the University of Sydney's publishing house and they've got a series of animal studies-focused books. They publish them under the um, banner of Animal Publics and there are lots of wonderful books there. I've interviewed many, many uh, authors from the Animal Publics series and I encourage you to check out Animal Publics both if you're looking for animal-focused books Or also, if you've got a manuscript, if you've got a lazy old manuscript lying around and it's animal focused and you're wondering where to publish it, get in contact with the people at Animal Publics at the University of Sydney Press. Okay, well, we're back in the podcasting lounge this week. It's a rather dreary day in Sydney town, but that said, we're in lovely Annandale um, and I've got a wonderful guest here. Tom Tom, the podcasting cat, has just popped out to see what all the fuss is, and he, like you, is very enthusiastic about meeting this week's guest, which is Mike Rosalki. Rosalki? Oh, I'll just practice that. There's something wrong with my brain. As soon as I, uh, as soon as I turn on the equipment, I, anything I knew at one point in time leaves me. But Mike Rosalki, now Mike is a partner and co-founder of K&R Animal Law, which is a commercial law firm that specialises in animal law. And he also volunteers and is a director and senior lawyer at the Animal Defender's Office, which is a community legal centre that specialises in animal law. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. Thanks very much, Siobhan. It's great to be here and thank you so much for creating this podcast. I think it's an amazing resource for the animal protection community. Oh, thanks, Mike. That's very, very kind of you to say. So, Mike, why animal law? Why did you get involved? I got involved in animal law because in my first year of university, I was studying a biological sciences degree with the intention of either working as a vet or an animal welfare scientist. And I thought to myself, well, actually, what needs to change with respect to animals is the law and what the law allows humans to do to animals. So I thought, well, if I want to change the law, then I need to know the law. So I enrolled in a law degree alongside my science degree. Now, whether that reasoning was sound, I'm not sure, but 11 years later, here I am working as an animal lawyer, and I can't think of many things I'd rather be doing with my time than working as a lawyer advocating for animals and their human defenders. Wonderful. So it was a good decision, and hopefully in the course of our conversation today, we'll learn more about whether you think it's been effective because, of course, as we know, the laws are very stubborn beast, although there's just been a big breakthrough in the ACT, which we'll get to. So can you start by telling us what you do over at the Animal Defender's Office? Sure. So the Animal Defender's Office, it's, as you mentioned, it's a community legal centre. It specialises in animal law and it provides, I think, a, a wonderful service to the animal protection community. It provides free services to those who can't afford legal services. And we get involved in a range of different matters. Uh, We help people who have an interest in 
protecting animals in many many different ways. For example, we'll provide legal advice to people in relation to, um, say, property disputes involving animals, where we think that our involvement is likely to benefit animals. We draft submissions in response to proposed government legislation that affects animals. We present at various public forums in relation to educating the community about the laws about the, the laws relating to the treatment of animals and also laws that affect animal activists and people who have an interest in protecting animals. And we have, in the past, we've defended animal activists in, in court uh, when they've been charged with, with offences in relation to exposing animal violence and cruelty. Wonderful. And that's all done on a voluntary basis? Yes, that's right. So, yeah, I think Tara Ward, who is the executive director of the Animal Defenders Office and one of the founders, she does amazing work. She does the she runs the entire centre uh, for free in her own time and she also lectures in animal law and is involved in a, a range of other matters relating to animals. Uh, so sh- she does an incredible job and I think she should come on the podcast, actually, Siobhan. <laughs> I'd love to get her on the podcast. So... Mike, just perhaps thinking for a moment about your work with the with the um, animal legal defenders office, uh, animal law defenders office. Can you see improvement? Can you see things getting better through that work and that involvement? Well, I think that the the law is necessarily a lot slower than societal attitudes towards animals. That's that's always been the case. the The law is always uh, res- responsive to changes of, of social conscience, consciousness. So in relation to the, the treatment of animals, the law is slowly tr- changing and I think it will continue to, to slowly change, but it is a slow change. But I think that the Animal Defenders Office, what that does is that it, it just provides a, r- a really good support network for a lot of people in the animal protection movement. Often legal issues do arise when people are trying to advocate for animals and it's, it can be very, very difficult to navigate the legal system. So when you've got a group of dedicated lawyers who share the, the same passion for protecting animals, that can be very comforting and, and very helpful to have lawyers help you navigate the, the legal issues that might arise when you're advocating for animals. That said, there was a big breakthrough or a big uh, milestone in the ACT recently. Can you tell listeners what happened and what the importance of it is? Yeah, sure. So in the ACT just recently, uh, a few days ago in fact, the ACT passed amendments to the Animal Welfare Act. And the Animal Welfare Act is law that essentially says that you can't do cruel things to companion animals. Uh, It does exempt farm animals from from the legislation and that that is the case in in every Australian jurisdiction but in relation to companion animals essentially it makes it a crime to be cruel to them. Now the recent amendments to the Act uh, did a number of things which I think are are beneficial for animals. One of those was that it recognised for the first time in any Australian jurisdiction that animals are sentient beings. Uh, That is that essentially that animals can feel and perceive things subjectively. So it was an express legislative acknowledgement that animals' lives matter. And I think that that, while in some respects it's it's symbolic, I think it's a, a very important step forward because while we have known that animals are sentient since Darwinian times, Charles Darwin uh, wrote extensively on the, the sentient nature of animals and... Actually, our, our laws already acknowledge, excuse me, indirectly that animals are sentient by making it a, a crime to harm them. It's the first time that it's been expressly written in legislation. And I think one thing that may, one practical uh, effect of that is that when courts are deciding on, say, punishments for, for people who have been cruel to animals, they may well look at the, the legislation and say, well, the intention of this legislation is to acknowledge that animals are sentient and it's a crime to harm them, and therefore I'm, the, the court might impose harsher sentences on people uh, because they, they are looking at the express words in the legislation that talks about the ability of animals to suffer. And were you in, 
involved in any way in lobbying for that inclusion? And, you know, was it a hard slog or, or were lawmakers open to the inclusion just on the basis of common sense, etc.? I wasn't personally involved in that change at all. Uh, I, th- I have a feeling that Tara, Tara Ward from the Animal Defender's Office may have been uh, involved in that. Uh, so, but I can't. I can't really speak more about the process of it I, because I wasn't involved in it. Mm, wonderful. So, Mike, you have also set up your own animal-focused law firm. Can you tell us why you felt that that was something that was needed and the kind of work you've been doing through that firm? Sure. So, my colleague Narman Krantz and I established KNR Animal Law a few months ago, and. We met as volunteer lawyers at the Animal Defender's Office and we realised that the the Animal Defender's Office is just overwhelmed with requests for legal advice. And so there was certainly a demand for for people in the animal protection movement or people who had an interest in animals for legal services. And the Animal Defender's Office, being a a free uh, service, just could not keep up with anywhere near uh, the demand that was coming in. So we decided to establish KNR Animal Law, essentially to test the market and see whether there was going to be a demand for for paid animal law work. And we found that there is. And so we have taken on matters in a, a really wide range of areas of law. So for example, we, we deal with property disputes because animals are still classified as property under the law. So when people dispute the ownership of an animal, it is a property dispute. We've been involved with uh, defamation matters where people have spoken badly about people in the animal protection movement. We've dealt with commercial matters where either organisations or activists who have commercial arrangements just require some legal advice on, on contract drafting. We've been involved in drafting submissions on behalf of certain organisations in relation to proposed government legislation. And we've been uh, involved in providing general commercial advice in relation to, or com- general legal advice in relation to, say, incorporated associations uh, and interpreting their constitutions or establishing uh, an, an association as an incorporated association. Wow, you've been busy. And so if people are listening to this and think to themselves, gee, I'd love to get myself some legal advice on an animal-specific issue. Do you take clients from all around the country? Can anyone contact you? Yes, we do. So we, we while we're physically located in Canberra, we actually run a virtual office and that means that we can take on clients in any Australian jurisdiction. Uh, in fact, none of our clients have been from Canberra so far. So we've taken on clients from Perth, from Kalgoorlie, from Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, so all over the place. So they can go to our website, knrmlaw.com.au, and they can contact us, can contact us through our website. Wonderful. So you opened up by saying that you wanted to do something positive for animals and there was a kind of a range of different paths you could have gone down and you went down the animal legal path. Can you say something about your time say, involved in the animal law community, do you do you see things improving? Is it a good way, do you think, for people to try and generate positive change for animals? What, what's your perception of the animal law community and that as a pathway to helping animals? Sure. So I, th- I think animal law is certainly an important part of the animal protection movement, but I would say that it's it's one of many, many parts to it. So the what I would say to people who are, are looking at getting involved in the animal protection movement is that uh, if you have an interest in law, absolutely go down the animal law path uh, because I, you know, I find it very rewarding. It's very interesting uh, and I enjoy working as a lawyer, but it's certainly not the only path. There's, there's many ways that you can help animals. So I would, I would say to, to people, have a think about what your skill set is, what your unique unique skill set. Everyone's got a unique skill set. So have a think about that. And whatever your area of interest is, uh, you can apply that to the animal protection movement. So we were just chatting before the, before we started recording, you know, there are a couple of events coming up soon. 
And I'm just wondering, is it uh, is there a strong animal law community? Do you think, or is it still kind of you're a little bit of an outsider if you if you show an interest in animal law? Can you turn up to a commercial law firm and say, "Here I am as a lawyer, but I've got this you know side interest in animal law"? That's that's a really good question. I, in my view, it's gone from a fringe area of law to starting to become quite a recognised and well-established area of law. So my understanding is in 2005, animal law as a distinct topic was first taught at an Australian university. And now in 2019, I think out of approximately 34 law schools, I think half of them teach animal law. And certainly I've met so many people who are practising lawyers who have a real interest in animal law. And they either uh, practise animal law or they volunteer as animal lawyers, or they are just very interested in in animal law. And there's multiple textbooks that have been written on animal law. And as all of the guests on your podcasts have shown, there's there's a lot of academic literature being written about animal law itself. Uh, So I I don't think it's a a fringe topic. And from my perspective, given how much interest there is in the animal protection movement worldwide, I, th- I see it only growing and I, I, th- I see it growing quite rapidly. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I guess now changing gears a little bit and thinking towards the future, you're obviously very busy. You've just established your own law firm and you're doing a lot of volunteer work, etc. But if you think about something kind of exciting that you could do in the field of animal law in the future if you either had time or resources or energy or enough people on side do you have things that you'd like to achieve or get done in your time as an animal lawyer that's a really good question i uh, there's certainly a lot of things i would i would love to achieve in a in an ideal world i think i would just like to be as useful as possible to those in the animal protection movement. I want to use my skills to try and create a better world for animals and the people that defend animals. So I think I think just trying to do my best to, to work as a lawyer and support those in the animal protection movement uh, is, in some respects, I think, creating a better world for animals. Uh, and th- I th- what I've found is that opportunities arise left, right and centre, when you are passionate about something and when you become a relative expert in in a field, opportunities start to present themselves and and whether that might be being invited, say, onto a podcast like this or being asked to present at a a forum to educate the public about animal-related matters, I think all of that just helps and and trying to help educate people in the animal protection space uh, about the law and how it relates to animals and how it relates to the people that defend them, defend animals, I think it all kind of helps to create a better world. Mm. Well, animal advocates certainly need lawyers and that's unlikely to change in the future, isn't it? Well, Mike, I ask everyone who comes on the program to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? Yes. <laughs> Can you recall when you first started to think that there was something wrong or problematic about the relationship between humans and non-humans? Yes, it was 2004. I was living in Canada, snowboarding for the season, and I was listening to a punk rock song called Waste by a band called Good Riddance. And the song is about the violence inflicted on animals in animal exploitation facilities. And that planted the seed in my mind that there's something bad happening to animals to produce animal products. And I think one of the most important lessons that punk rock bands try and teach their listeners is to think for themselves and not just assume that those in authority are telling you the truth or or what they're saying is right. So I looked into the issue and learnt for myself the horrific things that are occurring to animals in animal exploitation facilities. But I was still indoctrinated into a way of thinking that said I need to eat animal products to be healthy. So again, I questioned that and researched nutrition and as we now know not only can you absolutely thrive on a well-planned whole food plant-based diet but you also decrease your probability of developing a range of chronic and terminal illnesses yes indeed so you've managed to 
keep on moving with a plant-based diet. It's funny, isn't it? All that fear. My parents were particularly alarmed that something terrible was going to happen if I didn't eat meat. Can you recall the first thing you did to try and bring about change for animals? Other than not purchasing animal products, I co-founded a university club called Students Against Animal Cruelty and we held stalls at university to try and raise awareness of animal exploitation issues and we tried to have the university ban caged eggs in its food outlets. Oh, wonderful. And this isn't an official um, five quick questions, but how did your friends and family receive the information, like the news that you were going to go vegan and become an animal advocate and all that jazz? In, initially with resistance and I think because we are we are told from the day we're, we're born that you need to eat animal products and the, the meat, dairy and egg industries have done a, a very good job of promoting that, that message. So I think any parent who's not alive to the issues uh, will, will think that way, which, which is natural. So initially, yes, certainly my, my family thought it was, it was crazy and uh, encouraged me not to, to go down that route. Uh, but it's just, it was just through, I suppose, their own lack of education about the issues. Um, so I think once they, they learnt about the issues themselves and learnt about the, the nutrition side of things it was a completely different story Mm, interesting so this is now the third official question if you had to name one animal advocate who's had a big impact on you who would it be that is such a difficult question because there are so many people and groups of people who have had an equally big impact on me so in the early stages it was punk rock bands like rise against strike anywhere good riddance who have been passionately sing, singing about animal rights issues for many, many years. Then it was people like Lynn White and Glenna Sujis and Shatha Hamadi from Animals Australia who have undertaken in, incredibly difficult investigations and brought their findings to the public's attention through the media and through Animals Australia. Animals Australia's huge social media following. And they've had a, a really big impact and more recently, I, I think activists like James Aspie, Earthling Ed, Joey Carbstrong and Chris Delforce, I think they've done amazing things for animals through using their, their huge social media followings to expose the violence and exploitation that is occurring every day in animal exploitation facilities. And often they've done that at huge personal cost. Uh, so they've had a big impact and, and been inspirational for me. Wonderful. Well, what's the most important thing animal advocates can do for animals, do you think? I think that the, the first step is to not purchase animal products. And that's a really good first step. Uh, however, it's a, it's a passive, passive step. So if people want to advocate for animals, I think they should think about the skills that they have. And animals... The animal protection movement really benefits from people from all walks of life. So, for example, animals benefit from activists being out there on the front line, exposing the atrocities that are occurring, making movies like Dominion. Animals benefit from academics who really think deeply about humans' moral use of animals and publishing their thoughts in mainstream media and also academic journal articles. Animal, animals benefit from animal welfare scientists who can describe to the general public the empirical evidence that supports higher order animals' ability to suffer. Animals better benefit from politicians in parliament who advocate for legislative change to better protect animals. Animals benefit from psychologists who dissect why we say we love animals on the one hand and then on the other hand we defend to the death our right to pay other people to cause horrific pain and suffering to them. Animals benefit from artists who are out there creating art that questions our, our use of animals. Animals benefit from lawyers who advocate for them and their human defenders. And, I th and animals benefit from philanthropists who are out there supporting or even creating animal protection organisations. So I think, think about the skill set that you have and potentially join an animal protection organisation. For example, Animals Australia, who I think do, do wonderful things for animals, They've got a, a take action tab on their website where people can go 
and click on the tab and, and look at the steps that they can take to try and create a better world for animals. Wonderful. Well, Mike, if you had the power to change one thing about the human non human animal relationship, what would it be? In a utopian world, I would grant sentient animals legal personhood with the right to bodily liberty and bod- bodily integrity. And that's, that's the approach that Stephen Wise and the Non-Human Rights Project in the US are advocating for on behalf of certain higher order animals such as chimpanzees and cetaceans and elephants. Now, in that utopian world, legal personhood would necessarily mean that animals could, uh, that humans could not treat animals violently or exploit them. And for, for animals that can live happily with, with humans without affecting their welfare, I would attach to that legal personhood human guardianship. So in much the same way as, say, adult humans are the guardians of, of infants, the, the, human, the, the humans who lived with those animals say companion animals, would be the the guardians of them and would have to act in the best interests of those animals. Well, Tom Tom the cat tries to scratch me on the face in the morning. Can I bring legal action against him? (laughs) That's a good question. So this this is potentially some of the the arguments against granting animals legal personhood, but of course it's the granting a non-human animal legal personhood does not mean that they are the same as, as a, say, an adult human in law. There are many, many non-human entities that have the status of, of legal personhood. For example, corporations. Uh, so be, just because an animal, or Tom Tom the cat, is in my utopian world a, a legal person, it doesn't necessarily mean that they would be liable to the, the same... Uh, forms of punishment as, say, a human would be if, if a human scratched you on the face. It, the, the law acknowledges the, the different levels of capacity that, say, uh, humans of, of different ages have and, in, and it would also acknowledge the, the different mental capacity that, say, animals have if they w- were granted legal personhood. And th- so Tom-Tom would not be liable for scratching you on the face, he I'm sorry. He knows what he's doing, though. He does it explicitly. Anyway, I'll have to talk to him privately about mm-hmm. it. So, I know this is going to be a big answer for someone like yourself with, with so much going on, but what are you working on next? In the in the short term, I'm presenting at the Animal Activists Forum in a few weeks with Tara Ward and Narman Krantz. Mm-hmm. We are presenting on how to advocate for animals without breaking the law. Following that, my business partner, Narman Krantz, and I want to build Kana Animal Law to be a real asset to the animal protection movement by providing high-quality legal services to people who have an interest in protecting animals and in matters that are likely to benefit animals. And we're actually also hoping or planning to create our own podcast as well. Oh, wow. Uh, it would be, be different to this one. It would have a slightly different focus uh, and... You know, no doubt that we, we would certainly need to learn a lot from you, Siobhan, about how to run a successful podcast. Uh, but that's that's one of our plans. So if we've got the time, we're going to do that. Wonderful. Well, you must think about joining the iRaw Podcasting Network where people can find a whole lot of animal-friendly podcasts in the one place. Uh, now, I should just also mention for listeners, by the time this episode comes out, the Animal Activist Forum will have passed – but it is on every year. Sometimes it's in Sydney, sometimes it's in Melbourne. It's very affordable and it's a wonderful way to meet up with animal advocates and also learn about key issues, including legal issues. So, Mike, where can people find out more about your work? People can go to the Animal the animal Defenders Office website, which is ado.org.au and... The Animal Defenders Office also has a Facebook page. And they can go to KNR Animal Law's website, which is knranimallaw.com.au. And KNR Animal Law also has a Facebook page. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we speak to animal studies scholars 
and animal advocates about the work they do for animals. And you can also find us on the internet, Twitter at knowing underscore animals, Facebook at knowing animals, and also on Instagram. Finally, don't forget to leave a review on iTunes. Reviews make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D dot com.